Let's talk about Claude. So this year, a lot has happened. In March, Claude 3, Opus, Sonnet, Haiku were released. Then Claude 3, 5, Sonnet in July with an updated version just now released. And then also Claude 3, 5, Haiku was released. Okay. Can you explain the difference between Opus, Sonnet, and Haiku? and how we should think about the different versions. Yeah, so let's go back to March when we first released uh, these three models. So, you know, our thinking was, you know, different companies produce kind of large and small models, better and worse models. We felt that there was demand both for a really powerful model, um, you know, and you that might be a little bit slower that you'd have to pay more for, and also for fast, cheap models that are as smart as they can be for how fast and cheap, right? Whenever you want to do some kind of like, you know, difficult analysis, like if I, you know, I want to write code, for instance, or, you know, I want to, I want to brainstorm ideas, or I want to do creative writing. I want the really powerful model. But then there's a lot of practical applications in a business sense where it's like, I'm interacting with a website. I, you know, like, I'm like doing my taxes or I'm, you know, talking to a, you know, to like a legal advisor and I want to analyze a contract or, you know, we have plenty of companies that are just like, you know, I, you know, I want to do autocomplete on my, on my IDE or something. Uh, and, and for all of those things, you want to act fast and you want to use the model very broadly. So we wanted to serve that whole spectrum of needs. Um, so we ended up with this, uh, you know, this kind of poetry theme. And so what's a really short poem? It's a haiku. Yeah. And so haiku is the small, fast, cheap model that is, you know, was at the time was released surprisingly, surprisingly uh, intelligent for how fast and cheap it was. Uh, sonnet is a is a medium sized poem, right? A couple paragraphs. And so Sonnet was the middle model. It is smarter, but also a little bit slower, a little bit more expensive. And an opus like a magnum opus is a large work. Uh, opus was the the largest, smartest model at the time. Um, so that that was the original kind of thinking behind it. Um, and our, our thinking then was, well, each new generation of models should shift that trade-off curve. Uh, so when we release Sonnet 3.5, it has the same, roughly the same, you know, cost and speed as the Sonnet 3 model, uh, but uh, it, it increased its intelligence to the point where it was smarter than the original Opus 3 model, uh, especially for code, but, but also just in general. And so... Now, you know, we've shown results for uh, Haiku 3.5, and I believe Haiku 3.5, the smallest new model, is about as good as Opus 3, the largest old model. Yeah. So basically, the aim here is to shift the curve, and then at some point, there's going to be an Opus 3.5. Um, now, every new generation of models has its own thing. They use new data. Their personality changes in ways that we kind of, you know, try to steer, but are not fully able to steer. And, and so uh, there's never quite that exact equivalence where the only thing you're changing is intelligence. Um, we always try and improve other things and some things change without us without us knowing or measuring. So it's, it's very much an inexact science. In many ways, the manner and personality of these models is more an art than it is a science. So what is sort of the reason for... Uh the span of time between say uh, Claude Opus 3.0 oh, and 3.5. What is it, what takes that time if you can speak to? Yeah. So there's, there's different, there's different uh, processes. Um, uh, there's pre-training, which is, you know, just kind of the normal language model training. And that takes a very long time um, that uses, you know, these days, you know, tens, you know, tens of thousands, sometimes many tens of thousands of, uh, GPUs or TPUs or Tranium or, you know, what we use different platforms, but, you know, accelerator chips, um, often, often training for months. Uh, there's then a kind of post-training phase where we do reinforcement learning from human feedback, as well as other kinds of reinforcement learning that that phase is getting uh, larger and larger now. And, you know, you know, often that's less of an exact science. It often takes effort to get it right. Um, models are then tested with some of our early partners to see how good they are. And they're then tested both internally and externally for their safety, particularly for catastrophic and autonomy risks. Uh, so, uh, we do internal testing according to our responsible scaling policy, which I, you know, could talk more about that in detail. 
And then we have an agreement with the U.S. and the U.K. AI Safety Institute, as well as other third-party testers in specific domains to test the models for what are called CBRN risks, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear, which are, you know, we don't think that models pose these risks seriously yet, but but every new model we want to evaluate to see if we're starting to get close to some of these 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 more dangerous um uh, these more dangerous capabilities. So those are the phases. And then, uh, you know, then, then it just takes some time to get the model working in terms of inference and launching it in the API. So there's just, just a lot of steps to, uh, to actually, to actually making a model work. And of course, you know, we're always trying to make the processes as streamlined as possible, right? We want our safety testing to be rigorous, but we want it to be rigorous and, to be, you know, to be automatic, to, to happen as fast as it can without compromising on rigor. Same with our pre-training process and our post-training process. So, you know, it's just like building anything else. It's just like building airplanes. You want to make them, you know, you want to make them safe, but you want to make the process streamlined. And I think the creative tension between those is, is you know, is an important thing in making the models work. Yeah. Uh, rumor on the street, I forget who was saying that uh, Anthropic has really good tooling. So I uh, probably a lot of the challenge here is on the software engineering side is to build the tooling to to have a like a efficient low friction interaction with the infrastructure. You would be surprised how much of the challenges of uh you know building these models comes down to you know software engineering, performance engineering. You know you you, you know from the outside you might think oh man we had this eureka breakthrough right you know this movie with the science we discovered it we figured it out but 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 I think. I think all things, even 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 you know, incredible discoveries like they 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 almost always come down to the details, um, and and often super super boring details. I can't speak to whether we have better tooling than than other companies. I mean, you know, I haven't been at those other companies at least at least not recently. Um, but it's certainly something we give a lot of attention to. I don't know if you can say, but from three from Claude three to Claude three five, is there any extra pre-training going on? Is it mostly focused on the post-training? There's been leaps in performance. Yeah, I think I think at any given stage, we're focused on improving everything at once. Okay. Um just just naturally, like there are different teams. Each team makes progress in a particular area in 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 making a particular, you know, their particular segment of the relay race better. And it's just natural that when we make a new model, we put we put all of these things in at once. So uh, the data you have, like the preference data you get from R RLHF, is that applicable? To, is there ways to apply it to newer models as it get trained up? Yeah, preference data from old models sometimes gets used for new models. Although, of course, uh, it it performs somewhat better when it's you know trained on it's trained on the new models. Note that we have this you know constitutional AI method such that we don't only use preference data. We kind of there's also a post-training process where we train the model against itself. And there's, you know, new types of post-training the model against itself that are used every day. So it's not just RLHF, it's a bunch of other methods as well. Um, post-training, I think, you know, is becoming more and more sophisticated. Well, what explains the big leap in performance for the new Sonnet 3.5? I mean, at least in the programming side, and maybe this is a good place to talk about benchmarks. What does it mean yeah. to get better? It's just the number went up, but, you know, I, I, I program, but I also love programming, and I um, claw three five through cursor is what I use uh, to assist me in programming. And there was, ex at least experientially, anecdotally, it's gotten smarter uh, at programming. So what, like, what, what does it take to get it uh, to get it smarter? We observe that as well. By the way, there were a couple uh, very strong engineers here at Anthropic. Um, who all previous code models, both produced by us and produced by all the other companies, hadn't really been useful to, to hadn't really been useful to them. You know, they said, you know, maybe be, maybe this is useful to beginner. It's not useful to me. But Sonnet 3.5, the original one, for the first time, they said, oh my God, this helped me with something that, you know, that it would have taken me hours to do. This is the first model that's actually saved me time. So again, the waterline is rising. And and then I think, you know, the new Sonnet has been has been even better. In terms of what it what it takes, I mean, I'll just say it's been across the board. It's in the pre-training, it's in the post-training, it's in various evaluations that we do. We've observed this as well. And if we go into the details of the benchmark, so SWE bench is basically, you know, since since you know, since since you're a programmer, you know, you, you'll be familiar with like pull requests and, you know, uh just just pull requests are like the, you know, the like a sort of a sort of atomic 
unit of work. You know, you could say I'm, you know, I'm implementing one, I'm implementing one thing. Um, uh, and, and so Sweebench actually gives you kind of a real world situation where the code base is in a current state and I'm trying to implement something that's, you know, that's described in described in language. We have internal benchmarks where we, where we measure the same thing. And you say, just give the model free reign to like, you know, do anything, run, run, run anything, edit anything. Um, how, how well is it able to complete these tasks? And it's that benchmark that's gone from it can do it 3% of the time to it can do it about 50% of the time. Um, so I actually do believe that if we get, I, you can game benchmarks, but I think if we get to 100% on that benchmark in, in a way that isn't kind of like overtrained or 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 game for that particular benchmark, probably represents a, a, a real and serious increase in kind of in kind of programming programming ability. And and I would suspect that if we can get to you know 90, 90 95 percent that 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 you know it, it will it will represent ability to autonomously do a significant fraction of software engineering tasks well ridiculous timeline question uh when is cloud opus uh 3.5 coming out uh not giving an exact date uh but you know there there uh is you know as far as we know the plan is still to have a cloud 3.5 opus are we going to get it before GTA 6 or no? Like Duke Nukem Forever? Duke so Nukem, what was that I, game? That, there was some game that was delayed 15 years. Right. Was that Duke Nukem Forever? Yeah. And I think GTA is now just releasing trailers. It, you know, it's only been three months since we released the first Sonnet. <laughs> yeah, it's inc the incredible pace of the, release. It, it, just, it just tells you about the pace. Yeah. The expectations for when things are going to come out. So uh, what about 4.0? So... How do you think about sort of as these models get bigger and bigger about versioning and also just versioning in general? Why Sonnet 3.5 updated with the date? Why not Sonnet 3.6, yeah, which a lot actually, of people are calling it? actually, naming is actually an interesting challenge here, right? Yeah. Because I think a year ago, most of the model was pre-training. And so you could start from the beginning and just say, okay, we're going to have models of different sizes. We're going to train them all together and, you know, we'll have a a family of naming schemes and then we'll put some new magic into them and then you know we'll have the next the next generation um the trouble starts already when some of them take a lot longer than others to train right that already messes up your time time a little bit but as you make big improvements in as you make big improvements in pre-training uh then you suddenly notice oh I can make better pre-trained model and that doesn't take very long to do and but you know clearly it has the same you know size and shape of previous models uh, uh, so I think those two together, as well as the timing, timing issues, any kind of scheme you come up with, uh, you know, the r reality tends to kind of frustrate that scheme, right? It t tend, tends to kind of break out of the, break out of the scheme. It's not like software where you can say, oh, this is like, you know, 3.7, this is 3.8. No, you have models with different, different trade-offs. You can change some things in your models. You can train, you can change other things. Some are faster and slower at inference. Some have to be more expensive. Some have to be less expensive. And so I think all the companies have struggled with this. Yeah. Um, I think we did very, you know, I think think we were in a good good position in terms of naming when we had Haiku, Sonnet, yeah. and Opus. That was Opus. great, great start. We're, we're trying to maintain it, but it's not, it's not, it's not perfect. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll try and get back to the simplicity, but it, it, it um, uh, just the 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 nature of the field. I feel like no one's figured out naming. It's somehow a different paradigm from like normal software, and 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 so we we just n none of the companies have been perfect at it. Um, it's something we struggle with surprisingly much relative to you know how <laughs> relative to how trivial it is to, to you know for the, the 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 grand science of training the models. So from the user side, the user experience of the updated Sonnet three five is just different than the previous uh, June 2024 Sonnet 3.5, it would be nice to come up with some kind of labeling that embodies that. Because people talk about Sonnet 3.5, but now there's a different one. And so how do you refer to the previous one and the new one? And it, it uh, when there's a distinct improvement, it just makes conversation about it uh, just challenging. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely think this question of there are lots of properties of the models that are not reflected in the benchmarks. Um, I, I think I think that's that's definitely the case, and everyone agrees. And not all of them are capabilities. Some of them are, you know, models can be polite or brusque. They can be, uh, you know, 
uh, very reactive or they can ask you questions. Um, they can have what what feels like a warm personality or a cold personality. They can be boring or they can be very distinctive, like Golden Gate Claude was. Um, and we have a whole, you know, we have a whole team kind of focused on, I think we call it Claude character. Uh, Amanda leads that team and we'll we'll talk to you about that. But it's still a very inexact science. Um, and and often we find that models have properties that we're not aware of. The the fact of the matter is that you can, you know, talk to a model 10,000 times and there are some behaviors you might not see. Uh, just like, just like with a human, right? I can know someone for a few months and, you know, not know that they have a certain skill or not know that there's a certain side to them. And so I think, I think we just have to get used to this idea and we're always looking for better ways of testing our models to, to demonstrate these capabilities and, and, and also to decide which are, which are the, which are the personality properties we want models to have and which we don't want to have that itself. The normative question is also super interesting. 